All right, we're uh, <coughs> back for uh, the second session on Piaget, or maybe the second and a half. Last time we were talking about assimilation and making the environment fit ourselves and um, how intellectually that means that we make the environment, when information comes in, we make it fit the way we think. I cannot emphasize to you strongly enough how important it is to know how a child thinks before teaching a child something. That's often not theoretically, po that's not possible to kids, kids thinking. So let me phrase it a different way. When a child doesn't learn something, I cannot em emphasize how important it is to you to ask yourself, does the kid understand what I'm talking about? For the child who thinks there are more fingers on this hand than on this hand, now thinks there's the same number, and now thinks there are more fingers on this hand than on this hand, you can reinforce, you can drill, you can give strategies, you can do whatever you want. That child will not meaningfully be able to learn addition. Even though the, kid, the child may be able to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Children who, are, who don't really get the connection don't understand the logic of taking nonsense sounds, and building them up into real words, into pictures that make words, or pictures that stand for spoken words. Some kids just don't get the logic of it, right? That's particularly different, difficult because the logic is often not there. I remember I once read an article in Reader's Digest. What could be easier than phonics? B, E, D, bed. W, right? W, H, O, O, who, huh? That works fine for bed, but it doesn't work fine for who. If H, uh, M is him, how did H, Y, M, N also get to be him? So that can be very difficult too. Exceptions to the rules can be extreme. I don't get it, how can it be? I cannot emphasize to you how, now it's easy to solve the problem. Oh, you have a learning disability. You have an auditory processing problem. You have a visual processing problem. It's easy to do that. It's much harder to try to understand how kids think. And I told you that one reason that the learning disability establishment, so to speak, is absolutely wedded to the idea of some, oh, it's an auditory processing problem. It's something wrong in the way the kid perceives perceptual systems. The reason they're wedded to that is because if they really understood psychology and the development of thinking, then they would have to acknowledge that some kids just aren't ready to learn things. That the school sometimes can't do what it says to do on March 4th or on, or, or on, on, uh, dis, on December 1st because the kid is not developmentally ready to learn it. And then we have to turn around and say there's some obligation that we have other than calling the kid a name. Oh, you're disabled. Okay, so it's extremely important to consider that. And as I often tell people, my first instinct when a kid can't do something is not to get in there and start to drill, but to back off and to see what's going on. Okay, and often you have to you have to see what's going. You have to see what the kid can learn. I, and I'm going to give you an example now from my own teaching a kid how to add that I did. Here's how he would add. He would say, add three plus four. He would go one, two, three, one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay? Add four and two. One, two, three, four, one, two. One, two, three, four, five, six. But if you add him, ask him to add six and six and six and five, he'd go one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, and he was stuck. Didn't have enough fingers. So I thought about telling him to take off his shoes and use his toes, but I said, okay, this strategy is okay, but I've got to see step by step what he can cognitively understand. So I start with four plus three. He goes, one, two, three, four, one plus one, two, three. I said, since you know there are four here already, can you just go four, five, six, seven? If he couldn't, that would have been the end of it. I would have told his father, who used to bring him for me to work with, he's not ready to learn how to add. 
So he goes, so I said, five, five plus two, one, two, three, four, five plus, eventually he could go five, six, seven. Okay? Then I took the next, and he could do it. I said, three plus three, one, two, three, one, two, three, go three, four, five, six. We practiced that for quite a while. And I could see that he could do that. Now came the big step, and this was the one I was wondering about. I said, I, I want to have an imaginary friend. If you remember, he called him Fred. Okay, Fred was his imaginary friend. I, let your imaginary friend do, your, do the first number. Can you do that? Fred will do the first number, so three plus four. Fred will have the three, so he went three, one, two, three, four, and he'd go three, and so he had Fred do the three, and the question is, could he, could he keep that in his mind and see the three and then go four, five, six, seven? And he was able to do that, three, four, five, six, seven. We started with the easy one, two plus two. And so Fred has the two, three, four, right? Eventually, then I tried six plus five. I said, Fred has the six, you have, and he go, Fred has the six, I have the five, one, two, three, four, five. He goes six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. It was done, it took a while, right? But each step I had to see whether he could cognitively do it, understand it, was able to keep it, in his, keep it in his head, keep it in his mind. His father said, you know, he adds great now, but he has a head tick. What's that from? Because I go like five plus, I go uh, eight plus three, you go one, two, three, go eight, nine, ten, eleven, right? Four plus five, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, right? He's always, you know, he's always putting a, I said, leave the head tick, don't worry about it. So, you know, and he wouldn't say what all, he'd go, nine, right? <laughs> That's why I didn't know what he was doing, right? So, these, okay, and of course I didn't say, don't use your fingers. It works, so don't do it, right? Of course do it. The next thing was, although I remember he had an exercise in which this was called a realistic math or a, a applied math. In other words, it was math that was supposed to be useful. So here's the question they have. You go to a store and in, there's a storefront window made out of glass. And in there are things with various prices on them. First of all, the prices are ridiculous. So a teddy bear, eight cents, a box of crayons, three cents. Right, that's really applied. And then they ask this question. What's the most things that you could buy for a dollar? Never mind what you want. Imagine going to the store and saying, well, I have 20 bucks. What's the most things I can buy? Doesn't matter whether I need it or not. I mean, I, it was so silly. So of course, what you had to do is start with the, the, the least expensive, then the next least expensive, and the next least expensive, and keep adding up until you got over a dollar. So if the sixth item got over you a dollar, it was N minus one, right? Sixth thing got over you a dollar, you could buy five things. If the fourth thing got you over a dollar, you could buy three things, right? I must have tried 42 different ways to teach him. He didn't get it. And I told his father, by the way, I also taught him how to subtract. That was a little harder. But eventually, you know, I taught the add up thing. If it's nine minus six, go six. Start from the bottom, six, seven, eight, nine, it's three, right? You know what I'm talking about, right? Here, let's go to the tablet. Yeah, missing. So start from here, one, and count up to four. One, two, three, four, you get three. Three, four, five, you get two, one, count to five. Yeah. You count one, and you count one until you get here. Can you get my picture in the, in the corner? One, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, it's five. Five, 23, okay. And then we got to borrow. It was, wasn't too bad with borrowing. You know? they call it, what do they call it now? Re okay, thanks. Call that regrouping, whatever. Little kids understand regrouping about as well as they understand nuclear physics, right? Oh, every one of these is 10 of these, every one of these is 10 of these, give me a break. Just borrow. By the way, most, a lot of schools are back to the term of borrowing now, because it's just, just easier to understand. So, and you have to be careful about, about that. But in the end, he just couldn't do it. And I told his father, he just can't do it. This problem is cognitively beyond him. And he got upset, because his father thought I was a genius, right? He was in second grade already, couldn't add, and I taught him how to add, finally, right? But I said, he, I just cognitively, he's incapable of doing it. I don't know what else to tell you. Did he eventually get there? I, I'm sure right now he must be, he must be uh, in his late 20s. I guess he got there, right. I mean, but you just, right, sometimes you have to be patient. And of course, the interesting thing about IQ is it has led us to believe the earlier you do something, the better. 
I'll, t I'll tell you some family secrets. Just said I get a call from my son, right? His, there's people are pushing him to toilet train, train him. He's 21, he's 22 months old. Let me tell you, for those of you who don't have kids yet and who will, you're not going to be able to toilet train a boy at 22 months old. Done. It's be quite, quite miraculous. So one time, this same son, yeah, go ahead. It, it may be possible. It usually isn't. Yeah, go ahead. Did they try a bunch of stuff? Or Say it again. Have they tried like to make it out of a game? Yeah, you can make it a game. The problem is you have to have the muscular control to be able to do it. And in general, boys, for for reasons I don't remember, in general, the, the neuromuscular development of boys lags behind that of girls. That's one reason more boys than girls have lousy handwriting. The fine motor skill to write. A lot more girls have it in the first grade than boys do. They just can't do it. For instance, he, I mean, it's clear. If you tell him, hold up to, he can hold up a finger. He'll tell him, he, his speech is excellent. He speaks in five word sentences. Daddy, lie down too. That's four, right? He tells me, but son tells me. If you tell him to hold up two fingers, he can't get the second one up, right? So, yeah, you can make it, but you can't. So I remember, so this same son, my Aunt Ruth comes to visit, and he wasn't toilet training. He was just about two. And he had made a thing out of her. He knew he wanted him to be toilet trained, so he didn't want to. She said, oh, my God, he's not toilet trained. Why? Gil, that's my cousin Gil, her son, was toilet trained at 10 months old. Believe me, he wasn't. So I said to her, Aunt Ruth, I promise you, by the time he's 27, he'll be toilet trained. Why is it so important, important to do it so fast? By the way, you will read someplace that kids who learn to read very early, at age three, three are ahead of their, their peers in first grade and second grade. They're always ahead of the kids who learn to read, start to learn to read in kindergarten or in first grade. But that's only until the fifth grade, only until they're 10. After that, the difference goes away. Does anybody really care now? When you go into a job, does anybody ask you or apply to college, how old were you when you were toilet trained? Does anybody care? <laughs> does anybody say to you, how old were you when you learned to walk? Does anybody care how old you were when you learned to talk? Who cares? And I'm ready to bet that there's absolutely no connection or kind of call correlation between one's ability to speak beautifully in public and at what age the per people learn to talk. I'm ready to bet that. I mean, I can't prove it because nobody would be so silly to waste time investigating that, right? But it's just, it's almost, it's, it's almost silly. There are some scales of ch childhood personality. Uh, infant personality, newborns and what personality they have. Are they active, are they passive? They have absolutely zero connection to the same kid's personalities at five years old, okay? So, I mean, what's the difference how fast it happens? Why are we so compulsive? Oh, now you gotta learn how to read and write in kindergarten, why? There's a book. Actually, I have a comment about that. Yeah, go ahead. Because I think that kids, you're, you've got a stigma that's attached to you if you don't learn at a certain rate or a certain age, and you have right. emotional distress in school if you feel like you're different, and it doesn't make a difference to the child. So those early signs of development are, and those milestones are important in targeting if there's going to be a problem. Well, here's anything. the point. Here's the point. There's a normal range at which things happen. Once you get way outside the normal range, you begin to be suspicious. And by the way, Piagetians can identify the normal range quite well because they're taught, they have identified clearly the sequence of development of things like ability to read, ability to talk, ability to write, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? <clears throat> They've identified that clearly. If it gets way outside, right? I told you about the kid I found who was almost nine, eight and a half. And he would still use pre-operational reasoning completely. And I'm the one who spotted and I said, hey, there's probably something neurologically wrong there. Because eight and a half is already way outside for having no pre -op concrete operational reasoning at all, which we'll get to. But uh, let's go to the tablet. I, I suggest to you, if you want to read an interesting book called The Hurried Child by David Elkind. And this, this, book, this book really points out points out the kinds of damage that can be done by pushing kids to do things before they're ready. And then it's a, it's a nice read, right? If you yourself have young children, you really ought to read it. Okay, I'm telling that to everybody here. Okay, so 
Okay. However, okay, come back to me. Piaget also talks about, let's go, matter of fact, I'm sorry, let's go back to the, uh, the PowerPoint. He also talks about accommodation. And accommodation is changing the way you are in response to the environment. Indeed, we know that children, our reasoning is better than it was when we were little children. Well, we don't know that, but we know it's better than re little children's reasoning. Come back to me now if you can. I gave you a challenge to think of permanent changes that occur physically. Because remember, the physical body is Piaget's model. It's not really a model. He says our minds and our, and our, our, bodies, our thinking and our physical development both work in accordance with fundamental biological principles because we're a biological organism. Can anybody think of permanent changes that can occur to an individual organism, to an individual person, based upon interaction with the environment. And in order to deal better with the environment, there's a permanent change that you make, right? Not like growing teeth. That doesn't count because that's wired in. You might think of one. They're a little hard. I'll, 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 give, you, I'll give you a few. Of course, I've had a few biology students <laughs> over the years, and I've collected them from them. Okay, one is um, <coughs> skin color. Okay, the sun is not very good for your skin, beating directly on your skin. Okay, in case you haven't uh, figured that out yet. So, what does your body do in order to protect your skin? There's a natural mechanism of what does it do? Push it down. Melanin? Yeah, melanin. It, it pushes coloring melanin to the top, okay, to get your skin darker. So people who have very, very light skin, right, often it, it, the body will put blotches of the melanin. What do we call those? Push it down, say it. Freckles. Freckles. That's blotches of melanin. Your body desperately trying to protect you from burning in the sun, okay? And that change tends to be, tends to be, it's, it's at least semi-permanent, okay? No matter what your, you can get kind of your quote unquote natural skin color, uh, I gotta say this in a acceptable way for our television, by looking at the parts of your body that ordinarily are not exposed to the sun, how's that, okay? <laughs> Those parts are lighter in color than your face or the outside of your arm. Matter of fact, if you turn your arm like this inside, no matter what your natural skin color is, no matter how dark or light it is, you'll notice that it's lighter there than out here, because this is the part that's exposed to the sun. And, it, and it's, the melanin rushes up, okay? Now, if you go inside, we used to have a term called invalids. People were told, don't go outside, it's bad for your health. They would stay inside for years. Their skin would start to get lighter but never back to the original shade. As a matter of fact, many, many years ago, in a universe far away, I, w I was a farmer, okay? <laughs> yeah, I farmed for a, few, for a while. I was a farmer, that's not, you know. Somebody's gotta do, we gotta eat, right? <laughs> so, it was summer, it was hot, and I see the sun is going down, and we're working, I said, and it was hot, I said, you know, I'm gonna take my shirt off the sun, just below the horizon. I have, I, I have, pretty light skin, did I get a sunburn? Holy mackerel, my back just burned to go, burned, right? And I got freckles on my back, right? That's my body saying, hey, right? It's almost like a, a sign, hey, stupid, right? <laughs> now I haven't farmed in a long time and I never, I really, a couple of times I've had bad sunburns, I never go out in the sun without a shirt on, ever. When I go swimming, I wear a shirt, I don't trust that the sun, right? And they're, but they're still, they're light, but they're still there. The freckles are on my back. It's almost like saying, my body's saying, you know, this guy might pull that stupid trick again. We better stay here in reserve just in case, right? All right, I, I have to say one other thing. Um, uh, the darker your natural skin shade is, the less you tend to burn in the sun. But uh, my, uh, when my uh, dermatologist found out that I was teaching, um, he, uh, I guess, he, apparently he told me he's all his patients who are teachers, he makes them vow to tell people, don't bake in the sun. Even if you don't burn, right? If you've been out a long time, you don't burn, or you have a, a skin tone that's, that's, that's uh, dark and you don't burn, don't bake in the sun. Just because you're not burning doesn't mean you're not, you're not getting yourself, 
exposing yourself to a risk of cancer. He said, you don't know how many patients I've had with dark, dark skin who are, he said, one of them was a physicist from India. And he's got dark skin, and he's full of skin cancers because he loves to go and sit out in the sun. I said, so what, you got a doctorate? You're that, you don't know that. That's a bake in the sun. Don't bake in the sun. Okay, that's enough of that. Stay out of it, okay? So that's one. Another one is, has anybody ever tried to run through the airport in Denver? <laughs> and there's no air up there. One day I went to, <coughs> I went to the, my wife and I went on vacation, the hills above Denver were about, I think 10,000 feet in the air, way just up, 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 up. <coughs> the Coors Brewery is another couple of thousand feet up. And we kept going up from there. And one day <coughs> we opened up a suitcase, oh, we were running out of toothpaste. Somebody said, see up that hill, there's a little general store you can go get it. It's such a really small town, such so they don't even have a gas station. We start to go up the hill. About halfway up, I thought I was going to die. You know, we're walking slowly. <laughs> I says to my wife, maybe we could just brush our teeth without toothpaste. Right? We finally got there. There's just no air up there. I mean, it's. A <coughs> but if you live up there long enough, <gasps> right? You're you're taking in air and you're pushing. Eventually, your your lungs by constantly filling up with it will actually push your rib cage out a little and expand their capacity just to tail off the worry, you don't get deformed or anything, right? Some people are making faces at me. But you'll actually have a greater lung capacity that's permanent, right? Now you'll notice in both cases, I'll tell you one other that's really an important one, your immune system, okay? Anybody here ever had the measles or the mumps? All right, I had them both. That's giving away your age. Now they have shots against them, right? Measles is a bad disease, by the way. Okay, you can really get sick from the measles. I really got sick. Right? There are still people who die from the measles. You get sick. Matter of fact, when I got the measles, the doctor came and it was a famous thing to help you with viral things called gamma globulin. There used to be polio, polio outbreaks. People would go and get shots of gamma globulin. It tended to make any cases of, of uh, viral infections that you got less severe. They, the doctor looked at me and said, boy, if your other kid gets measles this bad, you're going to be in trouble. So they gave my brother, put my brother full of gamma gobulum and threw him in my bedroom and he got a light case of the measles, right? You get the measles. I really was sick. I was a little kid and I still remember hallucinating and dreaming and I couldn't stand sound and I'd get hot and then I'd get cold and light would bother me. It was really bad. Matter of fact, the doctor said, if his fever doesn't break, my mother told me that the doctor said my fever didn't break by day, you know, within a day or two, they were going to time take me to the hospital at the end of that day, and the end it did. Okay? It's bad. But now my, my immune system, which was fighting off this viral infection, right, has reorganized, and I'll never get the measles again. It's a permanent reorganization of my immune system. That's what vaccines do. They try to fool your body into thinking that you're, you have the disease and there's a permanent reorganization. Now, some of them are not as permanent as we thought. For instance, they used to think that, for instance, the smallpox vaccination actually gives you, gives you cowpox. And then you, but the reorganization of your immune system also fights out smallpox. They used to think it was permanent. It turns out it's not that permanent. You have to get revaccinated over the years. But in the end, um, certain ones are like for the measles is permanent. And in each one of these cases of the reorganization, you're better off than you were before. You've lost nothing and gained something. So for instance, when your skin gets darker, right, by being exposed to the sun, which you shouldn't do very much at all, we already went through that, right? Um, you're still, you're fine. You, you, there, you've lost, you're doing just as well in, uh, in, inside and much better out in the sun. When, you're, when your rib cage expands, you do just as well breathing down here at sea level where we are in Houston and much better breathing way up in high ele elevations. I do just as well in a measles-free environment and much better in a measles-infested environment, i.e., I don't get the measles, okay? That's the nature of a true accommodation. You do better, okay? You lose nothing and you gain something. And often, okay, Cognitively, what you, you're, you're, even, you're, you're able to understand. So what happens is that you don't lose any of your old understandings that are good ones, but you gain new understandings, okay, 
cognitively. So what Piaget says here, let's go back to the PowerPoint, when you have an accommodation, what happens mentally is what I described physically. Mentally, you reorganize your thinking, okay, about time, about space, about causality. You change your underlying structure, pre-operational, concrete operational, concrete operational, formal operational. You change the rules you have for thinking and reasoning in response to new information. It's a qualitative change in thinking and reasoning. That's what an advancing to a newer, higher stage means. Now, you no longer make judgments about age. See if you can get my picture in the corner? Based upon height. You make judgments about age based upon other information, namely date of birth or relationships. This one's that one's father. So whoever the father is has to be older. Okay? What happens is that in response to the environment, to things that come in from the environment, okay, the person constructs a new mental structure, a new stage or a new scheme. A scheme is a substage. Okay? So, for instance, Piaget would say, I talked about changes in the respiratory scheme when it came to the lungs a change in my immune system scheme when it came to having measles, right? So he's saying, what Piaget would say, what we call subsystems, he would call schemes, right? You have a, remember we talked about an organized whole and subsystems? So again, it's the same with you talk about organization first, the things you need to know about accommodation, talk about accommodation first, the things you need to know about organization, about the stages, but, so in other words, he would say, just as we had an organism up here, and the organism has, he would say the organism has a neuromuscular scheme, and a respiratory scheme, and a, this scheme, and a visual scheme, an auditory scheme. I don't, know, that's, I don't know if he would use those terms biologically, but that's what he's talking about. So there's a change in the way the person thinks about quantity, and now says, it doesn't matter how you move your fingers. It's the same number because you didn't add any, you didn't take any away. Yeah, it's the same now. Now it's still the same because you could put these back, and you'd see they were the same. Okay, it gives you a logical reason. It's the reasoning that counts. Okay? The person understands the world differently, and this new understanding is better. You lose nothing and you gain something. You're able to reason better. You're able to adapt to the world better. Okay? Clearly, Okay, we clearly people, we have people, we have people who use, pre, adults who use pre-operational reasoning. What do we call them? No, not politicians. Stop saying that, okay. So what do we call them? What do we call an adult who reasons like a six-year-old? Say it again. Mentally retarded? Yeah, I don't know what the political term is today, but that's, that's, those are, that's the Piagetian's definition of retarded. You're thinking at a lower level. Not how many answers you get right on this test. You're aware that there are people who get unretarded. They drill and drill and drill for the IQ test, and their IQs go from 66 to 71, and now you can't call them retarded. But for Piaget, it's how you think, right? That's their definition. We'll talk about that later when we, at the end, about how, how much more productive it is when it comes to working with, with people who are having learning problems, who are have labels, right? So and with, what? Um, so with accommodation, you don't lose anything? You don't lose anything. You're thinking better. You, you change how you think, but there's no, you, it doesn't have it all of a sudden, well, okay, now I had a good answer to this problem, but now that I've accommodated, now my answer is no good. Okay? So clearly, that's why Piaget calls it adaptation. A person who thinks the way we do, Right, the way an adult does, formal operational people, I guess you're all in college, I guess you're all formal operational, right? The way we do, those people are more adaptive to the environment than a person who uses pre-operational reasoning. Children, if you said to a six-year-old who uses pre-operational reasoning or a five-year-old, okay, you're on your own, go make your way in the world, adapt yourself to the world, the, the, the child would die. Likewise with a retarded adult, an adult who thinks like that. We have to take care of those people, otherwise they're going to die. They cannot adapt to the environment the way we do, right? They can't figure out what needs to be done to function and to live. We can, right? You can balance your checkbook. You can pay the rent. You can go to college, hope to make a little money when you get out, et cetera, et cetera. 
So that's why Piaget calls these adaptations. Let's go back, adaptation. Let's go back to the PowerPoint. Okay. Well, accommodation is one aspect of adaptation. It means being adapted to your environment. Okay. So what Piaget is going to tell you, there are two ways to adapt to the environment, or there are two ways that are in uh, two aspects to our intellect. There are two aspects to intelligence and in how we adapt intelligence. One is assimilation, learning more. So intelligence has two components, learning more and understanding better. It's not just learning more. And if your whole approach to teaching has to do with learning more, you're missing half the boat. Your job as a teacher is not only to teach kids stuff, it's to have them understand better. And when kids don't know something, you have to ask yourself, is it because the kid, when the kid can't learn something, doesn't know something? Or is it because the kid, the kid, doesn't understand what you're talking about. Okay, come back to me for a second. Okay, I'll give you an example of the first one, assimilation, right? I have two children. Here are my two children. Tell me your names again. Rebecca. Rebecca and Shiva, right? I'll tell you later how I remember your name. <laughs> okay, I use an information processing trick. Okay, Rebecca and Shiva, okay. They're both illiterate. Hey, raise your hand, let the people, turn, turn to the camera, let the crowd see you. Okay, there you are. Okay, Rebecca and Chief, they're both illiterate. Okay, don't panic. It's first grade, okay? Rebecca comes from a house where people have read to her. She's seen people reading. She asks somebody a question, an adult a question, a mother or father or another adult in the house, and the adult says, you know what? I really don't know. Let me go look in a book, and I'll get the information for you. Shiva has never seen reading. She's never seen anybody reading. So when I say, okay, I'm going to teach you how to read, Rebecca says, oh, he's going to teach me how to play that game. She even said, what? what's he talking about? I don't know what he's talking about. It doesn't mean anything. That's a lack of knowledge on her part. She just doesn't know what reading is. She's way, right? And I'm going to have to explain to her there are things, you look in books, you can read, etc., etc. But understanding of reading also makes a difference. I have to tell you, I almost got a master's degree in reading. That's a big secret. Don't tell anybody, right? And I, my professor said, but he knew that I was wandering over into this Piaget and stuff was, was, was what happened. And he said to me, so he knew I was interested in me, so he said, I got to tell you what happened. He said, I was in with a bunch of three-year-olds in a nursery, and I was asking the kids about reading. So I said to the kids, how, do, how does reading work to one kid? So he said, well, the teacher opens a book and the book talks to her. He said, you mean, she, it, you mean like regular talk? He said, yeah. The book says stuff to her and then she says it to us. She says, so she hears it, right? He said, yeah. He said, well, why can't you open it and it talks to you? He said, no, no, no. He said, the books only talk to teachers. So only teachers can hear books. I can't hear the book. So he says to the kid, oh, he said, so whenever the teacher opens the book, if she opens the book, the book will talk to her. He said, oh, no, no, no. He said, when I said, the book only talks by the piano. <laughs> so, <laughs> by the piano. So, so he said he went to ask the teacher what happened. She said, well, <clears throat> There were chairs. She would play the piano for the kids, and the kids would sing. And the kids would sit in chairs and back the piano. When she would read to them, she'd have the kids push back the chairs, and she would turn around and sit with her back to the piano, and they'd sit in front of her and read. So she'd say, reading time, and they'd all run and push the chairs back, and she would sit down by the piano. So he, so he but he, before that he had asked the, the kid, he said, so will the, if, can the teacher sit at her desk and the book will talk to her and she can read? He said, no. Can't read by the desk. Book all, she can only read by the piano. It's the only place the book will talk to her. Now imagine starting phonics with that kid. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I was doing an experiment in a nursery school about kids' understanding of phonics. Unbelievable. 
I even had one. The experiment involved telling kids what the word was, what a word was. This word is this, this word is this, this word is this, and then telling the kids, okay, and then seeing if they could remember which that it was. Like this word started, like the word cat starts with a, a, with a, this word is cat. And then seeing if they could understand that a C made a K, right? So I'm doing this experiment. These were kids actually a year older. Come here. Come to the table. Okay, and this is the word for elephant in Hebrew. Peel. Okay? That's the word for elephant. Peel. That's how you write it in Hebrew. I was doing this in Israel, right? So I came to the kid and I said to the kid, this word is peel. See if you get my picture in the corner. He says to me, no, it's not. I said, yeah, I'm telling you. This is peel. He said, oh, no, that's not peel. This means an elephant, right? I said, yes, it is. Believe me, this word is peel. He said, no, no, no. Finally, my PhD and his professor's you know, voice goes off me. I said, why, how, why not? Why can't there be pieces? That's not big enough to be an elephant, right? <laughs> Only three letters? See, this is big enough, right? This is big enough to be an elephant. That has a lot of letters. But this is not. He refused. An elephant has to be big, okay? So this is this kid's understanding. Come back to me for a second. There, there, are, pe uh, there are people here. I, take, I change my mind. Let's go to the tablet. There are people called Ferrero and Teborowski who wrote a book called Literacy Before Schooling. Before schooling. Sorry. Before schooling. And they examined it. They did it in Spanish, but later it's been done in, in English. They come back to me now. They did, a, they did a book in which they talked about kids' understanding of language. So, for instance, most one, people who teach reading will tell you it is very difficult for children to remember small words. It is so in, and it's much harder for them to read those in firemen or policemen, right? They do policemen, firemen you know, tractor, they do it look by word recognition. Those are tough. They say, well, because they confuse them is and as and so and in and ah, they're all, that's not why. It's because most kids will think, young, young children when they start to read, two letters is not enough stuff to make a word. You gotta have at least three letters. And if something as big as an elephant, you need more than three. You know, so we're three and we need more, right? That's why it's so difficult for them. Not only that, kids will believe, kids will believe that there are, right? Kids will come to understand there's a developmental sequence in their acceptance of what can be represented by a word. So for instance, first they'll agree that nouns can be represented by words. Like you can have a picture of a, of a toad or make a word that says toad, okay? Here, I, I'll show you. Can anybody draw? Who can draw a toad for me? Okay, come here and draw a toad on the tablet. Okay? We're going to have a toad. Ferran Tabarowski showed, I don't know what that, here, make a toad on there. Here we go. Here's the toad. Okay? Hey, not bad. Okay, thank you. And the toast, wait, where are you going? <laughs> the toast sitting on a lily pad. Okay, and there are like bulrushes be right at toad, right? Okay, right? Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. All right, and underneath this, I can do myself, it says Sapo Verde. All right, they did this in Spanish, right? Green, green toad, right? Verde. So they have a kid and they said to the kid, what does this say? The kid looked at the picture and he says, it says sapo. So what does this say? The kid says, oh, it says sapo. Sapo, sapo. They said, yeah, but, but they both say sapo? The kid said, yeah, they both say sapo. He said, but, but there's only one toad. 
So the kids said, this is going on in Spanish, of course. But the kids says, well, no, there's really two. There's another one hiding behind these bushes right here. You just can't see it, right? Because the idea that verde, that a verb, that an adjective could be, this could be written, they couldn't get, grasp it, OK? Thank you for this. Is there a way I can print this? OK, so all right. All right, come back to me now. So this is re that's really good. So <laughs> clearly, it's not only how much you know, but how you think that determines what you can learn. And not only that, but here, come, to, come back to the PowerPoint, OK? The job of the teacher is not only to te teach more, but to think kids to learn to understand better. And this is what really, really annoys me. I am very, 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 three more, very, very, very upset by the message that standardized tests like the tacky tests give. Knowledge is information that you can spit back. It's getting the right answer rather than thinking things through. And there's one right answer. And you have to get it, and that's what being educated means. Come back to me for a second, and I'll tell you a story. I shouldn't tell you on your fellow students. But a few years ago, teaching this exact same class, a student came up to me and said, well, you know, you said this, and the other teacher said that. I don't remember what it was. I said, well, we disagree. You know, that person's a learning theorist. I'm the bum of the theorist. There was something else. I said, but, 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 but it, 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 she said just the opposite of what you said. I said, well, I, we disagree about what. To, she said, but, but there has to be a right answer. No, there doesn't have to be a right answer to everything, right? If there were one right answer, we wouldn't have different political parties, would we? If there had to be a right answer that was obvious to everyone, right? We wouldn't have different, different opinions about a lot of different things. OK? So and ultimately, we have to make our choice. I re, and I'll never remember, I had one kid. Listen, I used to be a history teacher. So my examples, most of them are from history, or a lot of them are. He said, list. The six causes, six causes for the Civil War, right, or four causes, and the teacher had taught six. And the kid got them all right. As a matter of fact, he had all six down. So I couldn't, uh, I couldn't resist, right? So I, I went to the kid. He had, you know, I was helping him with math, but he was doing fine in history and stuff. So I, he showed me this paper. It was very proud of him. And I said, and one of the reasons was economics. I said, explain to me how economics were a cause of the Civil War. You know how kids tell you they don't know. They do it with their shoulders, right? No, I don't know. He said, well, well, I don't know. I don't know. Just economics. And there was another one I can't remember. Uh, he actually even asked him about slavery. He was able to say, well, the North was against slavery and the South was for slavery. But when I pointed out to him, I already talked about, didn't we, about the Secretary of State of the Confederacy being anti-slavery. And one of the big generals having no particular problem with the Union generals, I think it was, it was either Sheridan or Sherman. I think it was Sherman, right? He didn't know what to say. I mean, he had no idea. There, were, there was another one, uh, oh, oh, foreign relations. Uh, there, there was another one about, uh, oh, um, another cause was, had to do with, um, transportation systems, right? The teacher had it out that way, right? The North basically was a transportation system based on roads and railroads. And the South was based mostly on water, OK? So you didn't need, it was, it was much less technologically uh, uh, you know, advanced, so to speak, right? I had no idea. Just listed it, blah, 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 blah. And couldn't think the things through. All right. Now, we're going to need to talk now about what it is, in fact, that Piaget says causes accommodations. What causes changes in <clears throat> 
cause us to change the way what we think. Okay, here, let's go back to the PowerPoint. BSA says these are the four mechanisms of accommodation, right? These are the four mechanisms that cause accommodation. Remember, accommodation is one of the ways we adapt to the environment by thinking better. One way is assimilation. We adapt to the environment by making the environment fit how we are. And we also adapt by making ourselves fit the environment when the way we are can't handle what the environment gives us. Okay, so physical environment, social interaction, maturation, equilibration. That's it. You got it? On to the next topic. I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. There they are, okay? The first way, there you can see them, the first way that Piaget says we accommodate, that our reasoning changes, is interaction with the physical environment. Okay, here we go. Or interaction with the physical environment or problem solving. It's with the physical environment, the things around us. For pre-operational children, this includes hands-on activity, not sitting and saying, two plus two is four, two plus two is four, the way the DISTAR program does it, right, or others. Drill, 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 drill. No, it's actually working with things in the environment. I don't know who said this. It's a common quote. Everybody says it. Play is a child's work. It must have been somebody who said, I don't know who it is. If anybody knows, let me know so I can credit it properly. Play is a child's work. And most of you have noticed, right, if you, if you, Come back, if, if you, never mind, stay here. Okay, that's fine. If you, if you have ever watched an infant, the question of how do I motivate a child is a ridiculous one, okay? My, my grandson, who at the time this was filmed, right, a few months ago was, the time this film was 18 months old, he's coming, here he comes, right, he's coming to visit. Baby broke the house. Here he comes. Take all the stuff in the bottom and put it on the top. Don't worry, he found things to break anyway. All the glass goes up here. The picture's all on the top shelf. Thinks, oh, this is nice. Throw it. See it. What's going on? What's happening? Kids are constantly playing, looking into things. Oh, stick the key into the, into the, uh, you know, into the wall outlet. See what happens. Ooh, that was fun, right? Oh, throw this. See what happens. Ooh, I remember when I was a little kid, I took my shirt and I went like this. I still remember, I want to see what would happen if I cut like this. Well, I got a bigger hole than if I just cut like this, right? Just made a little... I mean, it was just so much fun and do this. And they're always exploring and looking. People are internally motivated. That's the nature of a human being, to want to adapt to the environment, to interact with it and find out what's going on. All right, let's go back to the PowerPoint again. I'm sorry for this mess. Okay, for concrete and formal operational individuals, this can include hands-on but also minds-on activities. For Piagetians, the nature of education is giving kids problems to solve. If you go to a Piagetian school, at the time I'm discussing this, we have a very Piagetian approach to the, uh, <coughs> to the lab school on campus. If you go there, you will see that they're always giving kids problems to solve, problems to solve, problems to solve. They'll suspend a pendulum you know, from a pendulum to suspend a beanbag from the ceiling and then have, uh, uh, you know, plastic uh, bowling pins and ask the kid, how do you knock down all ten at once with one swing of the pendulum? How do you put them? How do you get them to fall down? By the way, it's not so easy. The first way I put it up didn't work too well, right? <laughs> how do you do this? How do you do that? There are no rules, preset rules, in most Piagetian classrooms. Not even in a kindergarten. Right? You're, off, you're told, set the rules, tell the kids what they are, and then you can go, right? Here's the rule, right? If you don't do your homework, when you sit down, I pull the lever and the electric chair goes off and you say... It is not true that just because you set the rules, you can do whatever. The rule is, I will publicly humiliate you if you don't do your homework. That's not a good rule. You cannot say, as long as the kid knows what the rules are, they're fine. That's just not true. You can have lousy rules, too. But in Piagetian schools, there are no rules until you need one. So if you have little kids, believe me, somebody's going to bite. Okay? Got to sit down now. What do we do about biting? You have a discussion. How do you bite? And you can do this with three-year-olds and four-year-olds. Is it good to bite? Is it bad to bite? Biting hurts. We should... In the end, obviously, you're directing it a little. 
you have a rule not to bite. And in the PRJ educator I talked to, if it's, what's today? If it's Sally who did the biting, today's a she day, that becomes Sally's rule not to bite. Okay? Is this where behavioralism might come in handy? You what? Know, is this where you might have punishment versus... No, there's uh, no punishment. I, I know, but if they do bite, is there any consequences? Well, then you have to the talk rule? about it. The, the interesting thing is, when Coburg ran his school about rules, punishment and reward don't necessarily mean behaviorism. The question is, how do you understand punishment and reward? So, for instance, Piagetians will tell you, if there's punishment and reward, the kid always has to un understand why. Behaviors don't care about understanding. Kohlberg actually ran a middle school and high school with rules, and then they would have a court to determine what to do after they had all, they would vote on the rules. And the teachers only had one vote, just like everybody else. Okay, it became tough. The only rule was you can't, you can't have a rule that's against the law. They can say, okay, we're making uh, noon to 12.15 pot smoking time. You weren't allowed to do that, <laughs> okay? But aside from that, the rule was, you know, you, you, rules were made by, by the students, okay? And it was to solve problems. And if a problem came up, you came and solved with a new rule. Or often, if something happened, right? You broke a rule and the person came and said, hey, look, I broke the rules for a good reason. You have to get together and decide whether to change the rules, right? Does the rule make sense? And then they would have courts and talk about what would happen in a court. We'll get to that when we talk about Colbert. But it comes from the internal, right, it's, it's internal, it's, it's indigenous to the process of education and of interacting together as people. Not, I'm the teacher, you do what I say. Why? Because I said so. Now, obviously, this becomes greater and greater possibility as the kids get older and older. Okay? So, for instance, you don't really decide in kindergarten what paint you're going to bring in. The kids can't figure it out. Right? And you obviously can't decide how to order the room so it's safe. Kids can't figure it out. You're going to have to do it yourself. But in the end, and, and, every, and everything's a problem. So, for instance, if you go to most places, you'll see the kids, and you want the kids to sit in a circle, the kid's name is on the floor, right? In a, in a little, on something, right? And the kid has... Like there's, I don't know, a sheet of paper with his name on the floor, and the kid goes sits with his name on the floor. Not in Piaget Indian schools, not in their lab school here. The teacher has like a placard with the kid's name on it, okay? And throws them around the circle at random every time, right? You never know where your name's going to wind up. So the problem is for you to go and find your name. And those kids can all read their names. As a matter of fact, I was there visiting once. And one kid is there, and he looks at his name, and he goes, and he looks, he finds his name, and he points to another kid. He says, he could read the other kid's name. The other kid's name was next to his, right? Come on, right? So they both sat down together, right? And they sat down, all right? So you'd say, well, now the kid didn't have to find the name himself, but this kid had obviously learned how to read his friend's name. He wanted his friend to sit next to him. So it's problem solving, problem solving, problem solving. And in the end, that is really the nature of creativity. The nature of creativity is having a problem and solving it, right? Artists don't learn skills and put them together. Artists have something they want to do. You even read in the literature some of the great problems that were in art. How do you show three dimensions on a two-dimensional surface? Once they figure that out, how do you paint reflections? Oh, that was a tough one. How do you paint water that's not moving? You will notice that you will find in Western art almost no pictures of water that's still. You'll see waves, but still water was a very, very difficult problem. The French Impressionists finally more or less figured it out, but it was tough, okay? And they talked about these. These are problems. How do you do it? How do we get to represent it? Ultimately, people began to say, I need to represent something beyond the reality of what I see. I want to represent emotions, etc. So if you've ever seen Guernica, does anybody know about Guernica? Guernica was the first time 
that civilians were bombed from the air during the Spanish um, Civil War. Okay, the the fascist governments who were supporting the fascist side in uh, Germany and Italy um, sent planes to bomb Guernica, where the the anti-fascist forces were holed up. Okay, and they bombed the city, and a lot of civilians died. And Picasso did this magnificent thing. Of, there's a, particularly when he did it was a of the horse's eyes. It was done like in, in murals or in sections. There's a horse that's obviously not a realistic portrayal of a horse with its eyes bulging out. I mean, you can see the panic. If anybody ever seen Monk scream, M-U-N-C-H, his scream, this face with a, you can see the fear or the panic or the something in there. It's not a realistic painting, but the emotion of the scream comes out. It's horrifying, right? So it just, it's just overwhelming. By the way, the original, I believe, was stolen, disappeared, but there are there are lithographs of it. It's just, it's, it's and some good reproduction. It's just unbelievable. So that was a problem. How do you convey emotions beyond reality? I and mean, you can read the artist talking about it. Art is problem solving. Problem solving. One time, well, never mind. I'll tell you that a different time. Okay? So, okay. So it's, it, it's solving problems in the environment. However, there's something else. Let's go back to the PowerPoint called social interaction. We, we change the way we think not only by our own interacting with the environment, but also by interacting with the thinking of others. This is actually called social transmission by Piaget. Okay, I call it social interaction because social transmission, or by the Piagetians, it does not refer to passing on cultural norms or community values. Rather, it refers to developing one's reasoning by listening to the, uh, the more developed reasoning of others. Your answer doesn't make sense. I'll tell you why my answer is better. And kids do that all the time. They're interacting with others. Okay? What do you think about that? Hmm, maybe. Okay. Therefore, people, there are people who will tell you, often people who misunderstand Piaget and think they have some, some uh, uh, a religious mission to push Vygotsky, they will often tell you, you remember how important for Vygotsky it was to interact with peers, right? We talked about that already, I believe, didn't we? Okay, good. Uh, I'm getting old, I don't remember anything, okay? And they say, well, for Piaget, it's like a little philosopher sitting in the corner figuring out the world. Wrong, 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 and wrong. Come back to me for a second if you can. For Piaget, interaction with others is crucial. Social interactions are crucial. That's why rules are made by talking together. Kids should play together and have the opportunity to talk together. Even when even when they don't uh, necessarily are not able to communicate with each other. Often when kids first start to talk, they have, Piagetians notice the development of talking. The first thing you'll notice in, in social talk is what's called parallel talk, right? Parallel talk is like this. One kid turns to the other and says, you see, I have, I, have, I have a bucket. Put sand in the bucket. Sand in the bucket, goodness, I pour the sand, sand in the bucket. Like it says, yeah, 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 my truck's going through the sand. And it's going, right, one has nothing to do with the other. They're talking about two different things, and they look like they're talking to each other. <laughs> yes, I went to a party yesterday. Yeah, 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 and, and, and um, the baseball game was fun. You know, I mean, it's not quite, it's not that sophisticated. But they don't, they look, they, they even say yes and no to each other. But, but eventually they begin to talk and interact. And I'm just, I mean, it's amazing. It's just... It's amazing when you watch little kids, okay? So they, and, and what, what happens is that eventually, Piaget says it's very, very important to do. There's something else that's interesting. There's something else that's interesting. <coughs> People, um, <coughs> once you develop, you completely reject the reasoning at a lower level. Okay. I, um, I'll, give, I'll give you a couple of examples of that. I'm doing my experiment with, um, I'm, tr I'm practicing giving Piaget testing for my master's thesis experiment. 
So I'm being, go there. And so I was working, this was in, I was in Israel, I was in a kibbutz, doesn't matter what it is, it's a, that, that time it was a lot of like collective farming communities. And they were, one of the people invented daycare. The, both parents were working at that time, it was very unusual. And the kids were in there, and they had the kids in a renovated chicken coop. Don't take it easy. They stopped raising chickens, and they, it was a long building, and they renovated it, so it was a lovely building, right? It already had plumbing in it, because you need water for chickens. So it was just lovely, but it was long, right? So they had one group of kids at one end, and one group at the other, and I'm working with the younger kids, and I told them, I'm coming one at a time, you know, don't listen, and I'm doing stuff that's trying to see what they understand about reasoning. So I have one kid there, and I had two, two balls of Play-Doh. And the kid put them in his hand, and he said he weighed the same. They weigh the same. Oh, wait a minute. No, and then I took one, and I poked a hole in it with my finger, right? And I, I put, you know, the clay around the edge. I said, what, what happened? He said, oh, I said, what did I do? He said, you made a ring. I said, okay, does the ball weigh more? Do the ring weigh more? Or do they weigh the same? He said, the ball weighs more. I said, how do you figure? I said, how do you know? Because it's the reasoning I care about. It's the reasoning. He said, because the ball has a hole in it. And all of a sudden, in back of me, I'm sitting like this, and in the wall, I'm back of me, I hear, I look, it's his older sister. You know, I, this is, I lived in this place for a while, so I, I knew who they were. It's his older sister. She, had, she was at the other end, and she'd walked along the wall and come to see what's going on. She saw her brother, wanted to see what's going on. She was, you know, coming from the, she was two years older. And she'd come from the other side to take a look. So he says, uh, she said, I said, what's the matter? She said, that's wrong. I said, how do you figure? She said, you didn't add any clay, you didn't take any, any Play-Doh, you didn't take any away, just push your finger through it, and the extra clay that you pushed, you wrapped around the edge of the ring, but it's, it's still the same amount of clay there. This is social transmission to him, social interact, right? I said, what do you think? He goes, hmm, let me think. This is how kids, little kids think, right? Like this, I told you that already. He goes like this, he said, no, no. He said, I think that's wrong. He said, the ball has to weigh more because it doesn't have a hole in it. So I said to her, Usually, people understand the reasoning of younger kids. They just think it's ridiculous. I said to her, well, can you tell me why he thinks that? So, of course, her brother, she says, because he's an idiot. <laughs> what do you think? That's what, I mean, right? That's what she said. What do you think? So by this time, this had been going on, and we've been talking. It wasn't as fast as that, right? By this time, all the other kids of, the young, of this younger age group are there watching this. I gave up. So I said, let's see what they think. So I said, what do you think? You think they weigh the same, or is one way more? And each kid, I didn't get their reason. I just wanted to pile it on her. Gets it. The ball weighs more. The ball weighs more. The ball. And her mopping as she went to look like this. Looks like this. I said, there are eight key people here, key people here, who think the ball weighs more. Only you think they weigh the same. How do you figure? She looks and she said, "What'd you say?" They're all idiots, exactly. And she stops and runs, goes back to the other side of the room, wouldn't put up with these fools, right? Exactly. They're all idiots. What do you think she said, right? So despite the fact that there was all kinds of social modeling and social learning, she knew that answer was ridiculous. And he, if he had been a couple years younger, he would have said she's wrong. But this time he had to think about it, right? He had to think about it, okay? And obviously now he must be in his uh, must be in his forties. He uh, <laughs> he knows that they weigh the same. Okay. One time, my professor actually took a kid whom he had filmed. This was in the old days before videotape, right? He filmed the kid giving answers to problems. He brought the kid in. It was about a year later, and he plays the film. And the kid says, and he had already tested the kid, so he knew where the kid was now. And the kid says, if he had two rows of coins set up here. Come to the overhead for a second. Already had done this, it was actually buttons. Two rows of buttons set up like this. And then he changed it. He left the one row the same. And the other one he spread out. 
And on the film, the kid is saying, there are more here. Okay? So, okay, come back to me for a second. So he comes, so he sees the kid and he says to the kid, he stops the film at that point. He said, why did you say that? The kid said, I never said that. <laughs> Didn't you see the film? He said, you remember being here? The kid said, yeah. I said, but I didn't say that. So he says to him, look. He said, we just saw you say it on the film. Look, I stopped. The kid says, that's not me. <laughs> and the film is from the side, right? It's not a head on. He said, maybe it's a kid who looks like me, he said. It's a boy who looks like me, he said. It's a boy who looks like me, he said. It's not me. The professor says, okay. We go on, and we, the professor already knew, because he had tested him before, what he was thinking. Goes on to the next one. And now he got a full face on, right, of something that the kid said. And he said, stops the film. He said, why did you say that? He said, I never said that. He said, that's wrong. I never said that. He said, wait a minute. We just saw it on the film. And there's the kid's face stopped on the film. He said, that's not, I never said that's not me. He said, we just saw you saying that. So he said, translate for me, he said, you screwed up. That's the best translation. He said, you screwed up the picture. He said, you played with it. You made me say that. I never said that. Right? He refused to believe it. Just like in your head, all of you acknowledge that when you were three, you thought that way, but in your gut, you don't believe it. Right? I never could have believed that. Right? As a matter of fact, once you develop, everything changes. That kid's memories change. Can anybody remember back to when you were three years old, incidents when you were three? Who can remember back to incidents when you were three or four? Yeah. When you, when you remember those, it depends. Like, I moved when I was three, and I can remember distinctly the two places, right? When you remember those things, everything you remember is coherent, is, cognizant, is, is in line with your adult reasoning. When you remember conversations you had, you don't... You don't, you're not in your mind speaking the fractured English that you spoke then when you were three. You don't remember saying teach and go to node. You remember saying taught and went and knew. Right? Your memories change. Everything changed. That kid remembered giving the right answer. Right? And ultimately, but it's so, but in, in the end, this came about both by it, it, being with kids and by, and by, 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 by experimenting and by listening to the reasoning of others. So people ask me, look, conservation of weight, which is what we just did, knowing that things weigh the same no matter how you change them, there isn't, there, if you find one kindergartner in, kindergartner in the world who knows that you're, you, you, you did a semi-miracle, right? You're not going to, f almost no kids. So people ask me, does that mean there shouldn't be balance scales in the kindergarten? No. Let kids play with them. What do I care? Let them play. Let them play with all kinds of stuff. But just don't think because you play with them and you point out, you have numbers and numbers, oh, now you explain it to them, they understand it. There are teachers who will say to you, anybody who's been a teacher who's ever said the following, I've explained it to you 10 times, why don't you get it? Raise your hand. <laughs> my, my hand's up. Oh, we have other people's hands are up, right? <laughs> when I teach the master's class, all hands go up, right? <laughs> Around the third time, you should have said, you know what? The kid just doesn't understand my explanation. The kid can't think the way I do. That's what's so bad about task analyses. You're taking your adult logic, taking, bringing it to the task, and breaking it down in a way that makes sense to you. But that doesn't, may not make sense to the kid. It doesn't make sense that a three-letter word can be an elephant. By the way, if you're ever going to teach little kids about money, they cannot get the idea that a dime is more than a nickel. How, am I right? Yeah, look at all the people who work with little kids going, yeah. How can that be? It's bigger, it has to be more. They can't get it. Yeah, go ahead. You got stories you can tell me. I love them. Another thing is my daughter thought that, that the stores, when you paid, they gave you change back. There was more change coming oh, back. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, man. I gave them one bill, one $5 bill. I get back three three bills and a bunch of, you know, and two quarters and this and that, right? Shel Silverstein, who wrote, I think, Where the, 
where the sidewalk ends goes from one dollar to two quarters to three nickels to four pennies. Wow, did I do great, <laughs> right? It keeps making trades. You ought to hear it. It's right, kids cannot, cannot get the idea that when you get all that stuff back, it's less, right? <coughs> they, so it's, that's how they're thinking and reasoning, and it's by interacting with these situations that they do. So play games, do it, but don't expect them all, of, all at once to be able to, to handle it. Yeah, I wanted to finish this today, but we'll see what happens. Let's go, to we, let's go to maturation of the brain next. I know it's not in order. Look, here's what you have to understand. Piaget's theory, come back to me. See this look on my face? It's not a maturational theory. Maturation means it's biologically in there, okay? Puberty is maturational. As long, all the environment has to do is keep the organism from dying, the human from dying, going to reach puberty. You can't do exercises. Oh, I'm going to, all the girls go like this. Oh, then they'll grow breasts, right? I mean, it's, it just doesn't work like that. It's just innate. Piaget stages are not innate. They come about as a result of interaction with the environment. But, let's go back to the PowerPoint. Piaget was a biologist, and he knew maturation of the brain had something to do with it. But this is only one of the mechanisms of, com of, of accommodation. Piaget stages are not only mature, they're not maturational. As a matter of fact, it's the least important aspect for him. Development requires a going interact, interaction with the environment in order to develop. Okay? There have been people, come back to me for a second. There have been people who have talked about maturation of the brain. One thing that happens is a, here, there's a, a substance, I think it's around the dendrites, called myelin. Thank you. And we see it's either called my, myelination or myelinization. It's not that I don't remember. It's both of these terms are used, which is like a sheathing. Here, come back to me, which is like a sheathing of the dendrites. And that occurs around the time of formal operations. Okay? But... There are several people, one was Gold and others, Luria also talked about the development of the brain to notice that, trying to connect that together with formal operations, but it doesn't work too well. Let me tell you one other thing about the brain. The brain itself develops by interaction with the environment. If the brain doesn't interact with the environment, you have, you have, you have uh, 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 abnormal brain development. Very few things are just determined by biology. So the idea that, ooh, there's something, bing, it's in your brain, it's determined you're gonna be a great artist is ludicrous. For instance, in order to see, your brain has to interact with light. You got it? Your brain has to interact with light. They've taken monkeys, I don't know if you could do it today. They lock them up in a, in a room where there's no light and it's got a double door, right? You close this one before you open the one to get out, so there's never a ray of light in there. After a certain amount of time, the monkey is permanently blind. If you take it out, I don't remember how many weeks it is, but you take it out, put the monkey out, it will never see. It's permanently blind. And you play with the monkey, do everything with the monkey, but it doesn't have light. It's blind. And if you then do, the monkey dies of old age. No, you, you sacrifice the monkey for science, and you do here, I'll teach you a new word, most of you. You do a necropsy. You know what a necropsy is? A necropsy is an autopsy on an animal. Very good. Who knew that word? Very good. How did you know that word? Good for you. You do a necropsy. There's abnormal development in part of the brain. You do the same thing. You take a mouse. You take a litter of mice. You take out one mouse. Take the mother. I know. You don't like it. You cut the mother's vocal cords. You put the two animals in a padded cage. I know. I know. You don't like this. And the mouse never hears anything. After a certain amount of time, the mouse is permanently deaf. Even if you begin to play rock and roll music for it or whatever, it's deaf. And when you, and, and it bringing, it's too late after that to bring sound to the mice. And if you do a, a necropsy, that there's a permanent mis, uh, uh, abnormality of brain development. 
So maturation is not the key. As a matter of fact, Piaget, a woman once said to Piaget, Mr. Piaget, my infant school children, she was from England, kindergarten kids, can do what you say requires formal operations. So rather than arguing with her that she was just looking at answers and not looking at reasoning, all he said to her was, that may very well be madam. All I'm saying is they went through all the other stages first. So he really downplayed the role of maturation. We have one more me mechanism, um, which, which we're going to have to do next time. And then we'll go into the stages, the mechanism of equilibration. Then we'll go into the stages, and then we'll, we'll move on from there. Okay, I'll see you next time.